Okay. Hey, okay, I am live. Last time I watched the beginning of it and it was super like this at the beginning, but then it chilled out after a little bit. So here we are. Okay, sorry. Um, I am doing a live Q&A. So that means this is not edited. Probably going to say um a whole lot. So if you can't handle it, don't watch this one. But uh, my edited ones generally come out on Fridays, came out on a Saturday recently because life happens, right? So I am here. I'm going to be talking through um, some questions that I've received on my form uh, called decluttering Q&As. If you would like to ask a question for a future live video and or you don't get to choose, I get to choose. Um, sometimes I answer these questions on podcasts when my brain is not working great and I need stuff for a podcast, it's great to be able to do a Q&A from these. So if you would like to ask questions for that for the future, do that in the form that is linked below in the video description. Okay. All right. So here we go. First question. Um, this is a home to work routine um, question, which it's, it's long. So I'm kind of going to summarize a little bit here. I tried decluttering my entryway so many times, but realized most of the items piling up are needed at work, not home. Do you have any tips for, for, for preventing work items from migrating home and keeping home goods solely at my residence? Um, and then a little bit going on, we have, um, goes on to explain, I seem to acquire duplicates in three spaces, entryway, backpack, and work locker. Um, a mild heart condition makes transporting a heavy pack daily unsustainable. Um, things get lost. She has to have something strapped on um, because she takes, uh, like she doesn't have her own vehicle. So there's um, no trunk space. So, all right. So lots of details here. And what I'm hearing from that is it's understandable. Like I can totally see myself being in that same type of situation and also having the same problem. So what are some things that you can do to make concrete reminders? So one of the things that you mentioned was in your entryway, you've realized the things that have piled up are of this certain category. Like they were supposed to go to work. Um, and I always like to check to make sure y'all can actually hear me. Okay, good. <laughs> um, but they're supposed to go to work and they've piled up here. So you've worked on decluttering your entryway. Here's something to remember the declutter the entryway. This is a pileup, which means it's probably a backlog of things that are in this situation. So what you're going through right now is the hardest thing. If you're following the visibility rule. Okay. Because the key to the visibility rule is that when you are inspired to declutter again, where are you going to start again next time? You're going to start in that most visible space again. And this time it's going to have a lot less stuff in it because you're doing it after a week, as opposed to maybe this was like a couple of months worth of things that had kind of piled up in that area. That doesn't make what you're dealing with right now easier, but it does give you hope for the future that maybe this isn't going to be an ongoing forever project. So maybe it is a matter of, and I know you have the, the health condition, so you can't take heavy stuff, but maybe you go, okay, this, these are things that are supposed to be at work. I can't take all of them. So I'm, you know, going to take one a day and you put some sort of alert in your phone that says, okay, I leave for work at 7 45 AM. So at 7 35 AM, I have an alarm that goes off every single day that says, take something from that. But let's talk about ongoing, okay? Because that, that's just something you're going to have to figure out. The container concept is everything, right? And the reason it's everything is that it is a natural reminder, oh, this has gone too far for me. I have too many things here. So having some sort of, if there's things that need that go to the entryway because you're putting it there because you are trying to remember to take it to work, that needs to be a designated limited space to trigger in your brain. Oh, that's right. This stuff has to go. Okay. So I'm putting that in there. I don't know if that's making any sense or not, but it's a, this thing is now full. So this is my trigger to remind me that I've got to take this item with me to work tomorrow. 
smaller, smaller, smaller. Okay. This is the actual designated space because when there's not a designated space, then it's like, oh, this general area. And then it turns into this big pile of stuff. Okay. That's for things that would actually go as far as like things that should never have left work and somehow came home with you. You mentioned the backpack. I will just say for me, I have to have a smaller purse. Okay. And I totally understand what you're talking about when you say it has to be attached to me because I'm on public transportation. That's when I started wearing my um, crossbody purse. Like that's the only kind of purse I wear because I, you know, was living in Bangkok with public transportation and like I had to have it on me because I was just going to randomly forget it if I didn't. Um, but because I started doing that and because the purses that I was getting like that were very small, I realized the value of just the, con I didn't know it was a container concept at the time because I hadn't named it that, but I realized the value of having a very small container of my purse, meaning I just couldn't stick stuff in there. So if your backpack is part of the problem because you're putting stuff in your backpack for some reason, forgetting to take it out. And then it ends up at home. And that's when you see if you can go with a smaller backpack. I know sometimes it feels defeating, but at the same time, if it's keeping, if it's preventing you from being able to take that thing with you, then that's the goal, right? Okay. Is the, the size of the container being that natural trigger for you that, Oh, this is full. This is too much. I can't do anymore. All right. Um, what do you do when the only container is the room? We've just moved and our kids seven and two now have a playroom. It's huge. The floor is completely covered in toys. You can't even walk in there. Of course I have to declutter a ton, but how do I start when I have no container for toys? Okay. So, um, we've talked about this before. So it's not that it's not that you can't get containers. Okay. That's, that's not what I'm saying. I just have to tell myself, Dana, the answer is not getting containers. It's embracing what the containers are. So in your situation, two things, okay? Well, several things. Who knows what I'm going to say? The room itself is a container. The people inside the room deserve space first, okay? So the container concept is this is the size of the container. You put your favorite things in first, and then whatever doesn't fit has to go. Well, your favorite thing in the playroom is your kids. This is the purpose of the room. This is the definition of the room. And what I realize um, from having had a playroom that was knee deep in stuff and nobody ever played in it because it was a total disaster and blech, wasn't fun. Um, I finally made progress when I prioritized play space. Okay. So the people get the space in the room first. What is the purpose of this room? It's for them to play in. And so that means blank, empty space where things are going to be brought, you know, down from whatever to play with, but the people deserve the space first. Does that make sense? I don't know. All right. And then with that being your top priority is blank space for them to be able to play. Then you will bring in containers that are determined according to the space of the room. So the room itself is a container and every container for toys, every shelf, all that kind of stuff has to fit in this. So you're not just going to, you're not going to determine which containers you're bringing in by they have an actual 700 stuffed animals. And so I have to go buy shelves or whatever, some kind of storage solution to fit 700 things. No, we buy the shelves or the storage solution according to the space that is in the room. Okay. After having give pri given priority to actually people living in that room and playing in that room. Okay. So let's say that you have this room space and you go, okay, um, I need a, I'm, I want to do a shelf for stuffed animals. I'm going to do a shelving unit for stuffed animals. You go, all right, this is the size of the part of the room that I am willing to devote to stuffed animals. This is what, Cinder, stay here with mommy. Cinder, come here, stay here with me. She, there's, um, you know, I'm in my new office. I need you to stay with mommy in case there's a cat. Okay, come on, come on. You can stay with mommy, I know. Um, there's a cat, there's cats sometimes that get 
in the little barn thing and then she goes berserk. So I'm trying to not let that happen. Anyway, so the size of the room determines the size of the um, storage piece that you can put there. And then the size of the storage piece determines how many stuffed animals you can keep. So that you're going according to the size of the container, the room being a container first. Does that make sense? So the containers that you have to put stuff in are determined by the size of the room, which is itself a container. So then at that point, when you have that shelf, then the kids get to choose what are your favorite stuffed animals. Where we're going to say you get two shelves and you get two shelves and you get two shelves. And um, each of you put your favorite stuffed animals on the shelves first. And once it's full, that's going to be it. Okay. That's all we can do. All right. If I have to shut this down really quickly, it's because we've had cat issues. I'm just saying. All right. It's the fun of living in the country, right? Okay. So um, how to get your family motivated. Also with this came in the comment, better is good are the best three words ever. I love that. So I'm glad you're seeing success with that. Um, how to get your family motivated. Work on your own stuff. Work on routines. Create routines. Uh and declutter in visible spaces, your own stuff and neutral stuff first, so that they are seeing the benefits of having less stuff so that they are experiencing that when you have them do a five minute pickup, because that's the first thing to bring your family in on. It's the greatest thing for kids. When you have them do that, they see, wow, five minutes makes a huge impact because I'm assuming mom, I don't know. I didn't read the name mom has been getting rid of a lot of stuff. They're not going to think all through that. They're just going to think, wow, our, our house is different than it used to be. Our house is easier to handle than it used to be. Our house looks nicer than it used to. Um, as my kids would always say, our house looks like other people's houses. <laughs> okay. Um, what, oh, why do I do this? Sometimes I get it wrong. Okay. Um, oh my goodness. Sorry. I'm trying to get my thing. And if I don't do it right, there we go. What do you do when the only can, oh, no, I already did that one. Um, what do you do when the answer to the question, where would I look for this first, cannot remain the answer that it is? Are you ready to sit? You're not going to run over there. Okay. I know, baby. Um, when the answer to the question uh, can't be the place where I would actually look for it first, because I'm trying to clear the visual clutter. And the example was my glue gun. I would look for it first on the counter, but I want that counter to be clear. Okay. Come here. Nope. Come here. Come here. Come here. Okay. Um, this is one of those that the people who hate my live videos are going to love so much. <laughs> okay. Um, so what do you do? Well, in that case, you ask yourself if this counter was clear, which is my goal here, where would I look for this first? If this space was under control, if this room was the way I want it to look, which is not having stuff out on the surfaces, where would I look for it first? Okay. So you just kind of, um, acknowledge the goal that it is that you're going for. My home is way better than before. Thanks to you, but I feel like it's still not good enough. How do I get to the point of enjoying my home? Um, what was your reason why you wanted to do this in the first place? Was it because you, um, would get frustrated because you would have this idea of doing crafts with your kids, but your dining room table was covered in stuff. And so you weren't able to do that. Was it that you were um, not able to have people over, which I know it's, uh, it's a pandemic. I get it. Okay. So we're all in different places on that, but you know, what, what was your reason? What was the thing that frustrated you that you weren't able to do because your house was so out of control. Take some time and be purposeful about doing those things. Okay. If it was that I don't get to, you know, enjoy sitting down and playing with my kids or whatever, sit down and play with your kids, enjoy it, feel the benefit of what you have done, which will help you relax, but it'll also kind of give you even more motivation on what it is that you do need to tackle next. Okay. Three out of four dailies, uh, which my dailies are dishes, sweep the kitchen, check the bathrooms for clutter and five minute pickup. Um, three out of the four dailies really makes sense for my home, but the sweeping one does not. What criteria should I use in deciding what to make my fourth daily habit? Okay, this is the same thing for if the four do work for you or none of them work for you or whatever. 
pick the thing that drives you the craziest in your home. The thing that just makes you go, why does this keep happening? What is the problem here? Solve that problem today. Solve it again tomorrow. And then um, solve it again the next day and the next day before it turns into a problem again. Because remember that first day that you solve it, just like dishes or um, checking the bathrooms for clutter or sweeping or whatever. The first day is catching up, right? Okay. And you're solving this problem. You're dealing with this thing. We'll deal with it again tomorrow before it's gotten out of control. Even if it feels like, well, it's not really, it's just moving two things today. You know, yesterday it was this big decluttering project. And today it's just, you know, putting two pairs of shoes back into the spot. Do that. Do it before it turns into a problem again. Solve it again the next day. Solve it for seven days in a row. And at that point, you are going to figure out the routine that works in your home for your family. Okay. So just pick the thing that drives you the craziest, solve it today, solve it again tomorrow before it's a problem again and solve it for seven days. All right. Okay. This one's kind of a fun one that doesn't really have to do with um, cleaning, but you know what? We're all creative people. And so who knows, maybe other people would want to hear this too. I appreciate that you were the single narrator for all three of your audiobooks. I love hearing your voice um, and seeing your face. Okay. I wouldn't have read all that if I was thinking about it. Very nice of you. Thank you. Um, la la la, on your podcast and your YouTube channel as well. Would you please explain the difference in narrating an audiobook versus podcast and YouTube channel? How do you listen to your voice and watch yourself on video with object objectivity versus self-criticism? Have you ever been nervous about speaking into a microphone? No, that's part of the issue with me is I love microphones. Like if you could give me a microphone to walk through my house every day and I would take it. I would love it. I wonder if I could get one of those. Um, that's part of my, pro I, I heard somebody one time on a podcast say they were like giving it and they were like, I don't think I would ever want to listen to somebody who just enjoyed talking into a microphone. And I was like, well, you know, there are a lot of us. That's the reason we do this is because we've always loved microphones. Um, so how do you watch yourself on video with objectivity versus self-criticism? Have you ever been nervous? Okay. Blah, blah. Do you sometimes make changes? To, okay. So anyway, um, Here's the thing. The difference between an, an audiobook is written out and like every single word has been gone over an actual thousand times to make sure that the 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 pacing of it and the wording of it is exactly what I want to say, okay? Um that's actually what I generally prefer to do. I like that, which is funny because sometimes I think I, I do that with words like some people do with their homes. You know, they're like, okay, let me make sure that this is in the exact right, right place and all this. I'm like, that's how I am with writing. And so the, an audiobook is after all of that has completely been worked out. A podcast and a video, especially these, is just me talking, like just me blah, talking. That was the harder one to get used to. Now, I do have 300 and I think I'm at 327 podcasts. That's a lot of me talking. It's like over 150 hours of me talking. Sorry, y'all. Um, that one is practice. You know, I, I will say the first ones that I did, I kind of took bits and pieces from kind of how I do at speaking events, which I will tell you, me speaking is different than this right here. This is blah off the top of my head. Um, speaking is planned out and practiced. Okay, so it's very different than here. Um, this is, this is the thing, these YouTube videos that are live and podcasts is the thing that was the hardest to get into was figuring out how to just keep talking. And I'll tell you, one of the things that, um, hit me was I used to do YouTube videos like 10 years ago. Right. And that was back in the days where they would tell you that a video over three minutes long was a really bad thing. Like no one should have a video over it. This was 10, 12 years ago. Um, and so I would work on my video and I would edit it and I would edit it way, way, way down. Well, it took so much time. And I can remember how I would be thinking while I was making the video that, oh, I'll just edit this later. And so I would restart and restart and restart. Well, then I was watching Food Network Star with my kids because we used to love to watch that show. The, the, <laughs> this is what happens like. We used to love to watch that show. And 
uh, one of the things when people would be on video is they wouldn't let them do that. Like they were like, you have to get through it. You have to keep talking even when you have messed up. It is better to keep talking. So I tried to apply that. Well, anyway, some of y'all love it and some of y'all hate it. <laughs> and that's just one of those things where I'm like, if I'm going to do this, this is what I have to do. I just have to be able to keep talking. And I will say that on the podcast, the the podcast I started right a year after the videos and I wanted to do a podcast and I said, I can't take on the editing of that. So, and I didn't have an editor for like the first six or seven years. I said, I, I'm only going to do this if I don't edit. And people knew that from the beginning. And surprisingly, I mean, there's people obviously who hate it, but there's a lot of people who are like, it's fine. We'd rather have a podcast than have it be perfect. And that's kind of where I, as far as like the self-criticism and stuff is I'm like, I either worry about it being perfect or I get it done. And I've chosen to just get it done. Now, when I write a book, that's when I worry about it being perfect. That's when it has to be very, you know, gone over a million times. And one of the things I do with the books, um, and this is not necessarily for the purpose of the audiobooks, but and this is just great advice that I've heard from other people and it really does work well, is to read your book out loud. Like read it out loud because that will really give you an idea of how the actual flow of things is. Anyway, I'm gonna stop talking about that because it's not really about decluttering, but um, let's see. Can you talk about art craft supplies and how to declutter those? What tends to clutter my house is craft supplies. My whole family likes to do crafts, especially around the holidays. However, we always run out of time to make everything we wanted to make. Once the season has passed, I pack it all up in a box and it goes into the garage or my spare bedroom. Both, I'm assuming you mean garage and spare bedroom, are now 90% full. When I go in either place to clean it up, I get overwhelmed. Okay, so going forward going forward, it needs to be one box. Okay. Cause what it sounds like here is every year you buy a bunch of new stuff and you make those crafts, whatever you don't end up making. And there always is something goes in a box that then goes and joins other boxes from previous years. Okay. So instead there needs to be a craft box. All right. Which at the start of each year, you look through it. You say, what are the things I'm going to use this year? And then these are the things that I need to buy. You're probably going to end up saving money that way anyway. These are the things I need, you know, that I need to add to that. And then when you're done, everything has to go back in that box, which means anything that doesn't fit in that box goes because you put your favorite stuff in first, the stuff you know for sure you'll use again first, everything else gets donated. But that doesn't really help you if those two spaces are 90% full of previous boxes, okay? What do you do in those spaces right now? Well, it's great because we're it's March 1st, isn't it? Yes, it's March 1st. And so you have all this time before Christmas to work on this now, um, follow the process. Start at the place where you can stand in there and say, what do I see here that's trash? What trash can I get to? And, um, you know, your goal is going to be to get all those previous years worth of boxes down to a box. All right. Um, and so you may have to go box by box, but follow the five step process. You can get it at a slash five five F I V E. If you want to have a printout of that, it's also in podcasts, in the books, organizing for the rest of us, which is my new book, which you should totally get anyway. Um, but those, that process will take you through any storage room, craft room, whatever, but it sounds like the issue is that you're just adding to, adding to, adding to. And so there's probably stuff from 10 years ago that you haven't been able to get to. Okay. Um, let's see. And you may have to go box by box. Watch my um, video that I did on a doom box, which is what some of those boxes that you haven't looked through in a really long time are going to end up being for you. And that is just follow the process, trash first, anything that obviously has a home somewhere else in the house, is just not there for whatever reason you take it there right now. Get rid of anything that's just a duh donation, work through the two decluttering questions, and then embrace the container, which the room is the container, and how much space am I actually going to devote to craft stuff um, in that? So that's what we're ultimately getting down to is embracing the space. Um, where do you keep things you are currently trying to sell online? 
And also, where would you store all the items you are saving till spring to have a garage sale? I have lots of garage sale items in boxes, but the boxes are a huge form of extra clutter. So where do I keep this stuff? I don't. This is one of the reasons why I ended up deciding that it was more valuable to me to just get stuff out of the house by donating. So this is what you're going through, the frustrations that you're feeling. I've been through all of it because I used to sell on eBay. So I used to see dollar signs about every single thing in my house. I get it. It's a long process. I've talked about it before. I think the video this week is going to be specifically about donating, but these frustrations is what got me to the point where I said, I see value in being able to take a large amount of stuff, drop it off, go away. It's gone out of my house. Okay. So, but what if you can't do that? All right. So where do I store the things I'm currently trying to sell online? Um, this is one of the reasons why the only way that I sell online at this point is Facebook marketplace. And I only do that while I'm in the middle of the decluttering project. So if I run across something that I think, oh, I'm gonna, I, can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, I gotta try to sell this, this part looks, I think it's really valuable. I will immediately list it on Facebook Marketplace. And if it has not sold by the time I am stepping away from this decluttering project, meaning I go ahead and put it in the donate box. So by the time I'm ready to take that donate box and put it somewhere else, if it hasn't sold, then I take the listing down. I know that's pretty extreme. And I get that some of y'all are not going to be at that point yet. Um, but that is what I do. So that means, because I have just found if it doesn't sell immediately, there's a really good chance it's not going to sell. Like the things that are going to sell and that people really want, I mean, people jump on that and it's a huge hassle, which is one of the reasons that I don't hardly ever do it at all. But only if I just can't let it go, I've got to, I've got to think about um, selling it. That's what I'll do. Um, as far as, but, but the situation that you're in right now, let's say you can't do that. It all comes down to the container concept. What space do you have to devote to that? Like what space in your home do you have to devote to having a garage sale and storing stuff? Because it takes up room. I mean, you just said that. So it's like, this is the space, either it's going to be my garage and we're not going to park in the garage, or it's going to be um, you know, this closet or this, whatever. And, and realizing that, yeah, it's going to be an eyesore. That's part of the reality of deciding to have a garage sale as opposed to that. But what is going to be the limited defined space and just having that limited defined space is going to help you sort out. Yeah. That's probably not going to sell in a garage sale. You know, I've always tried to sell such and such and those never sell. And so it just kind of will, just having a defined space, having a limited space is going to reveal a lot of things that don't actually deserve to go in that space. Okay. Um, same thing with, if you're selling online, you have to have a limited defined space that is your container. And when that space is full, then the other stuff is going to have to just be donated, which then makes you go, okay, I am going to only put my focus in on, um, you know, the things that I'm very confident really will sell and really will be worth it. Because when you don't have a defined space, you go, well, maybe, well, you know what, maybe, hmm, those things aren't selling right now, but maybe that's like a, maybe that's like a Christmas time item. I think I'm going to keep that just for, and, and then you just kind of, when you don't have a defined space, when you don't have a limit, then that's when it takes over. Okay. All right. I'm going to look at, I'm already at almost 30 minutes of rambling. I will, um, look through some of your questions here. See if I can answer a few. Um, what is your thinking process on donating a piece of furniture, like a cabinet wardrobe credenza for something like office supplies, gadgets, when it needs one definition? I am not sure what that means. Thinking process. Okay. On, oh, on, I thought you said, you know what the issue is? I have my glasses on. And I thought you said, what is your thinking process on donating? But you said defining a piece of furniture like a cabinet wardrobe credenza for something like office supplies gadgets when it needs one definition. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you kind of answered your own question. It needs one definition. Okay, now that one definition can cover like this is my storage thing for anything that, you know, is some people put office and crafty kind of together, whatever, you know, but 
but like, yes, it's, it's coming up with, um, your definition for that's what this space is going to be. Or, um, maybe it's, I guess I'm picturing in my head, some things I've been looking at for going behind me here in my office, but I've been looking at some things that have like drawers down here and then, um, shelves up here. Well, it used to be that I would be like, oh, that's a storage piece. And I would shove the drawers full and I would put all this messy stuff up on the shelves too, because it was a storage piece. But in my mind, I'm like, okay, well, only the bottom half is going to be storage. And that is going to be for something defined, like some definite thing. And then the top half, that's going to be decorative because that's what y'all are going to see behind me one day when I have my office put together. Um, that's going to be decorative and I'll have, you know, things on those. So, so giving, even if it's like this section, this drawer, this, whatever, you know, you might define it that way, but it does need an overall de de definition. Um, let's see. Um, my home went from 3,060 square feet to less than a thousand. This was not by choice. As I get rid of things, I feel poor because there's not much I can keep suggestions on how not to have this feeling. Um, I think the in-between process is where this is hard. I think embrace, I mean, cause I hear this from people all the time, embracing the reality of the space that you have makes that space so much more lovely and livable, you know? Um, think about, I mean, there are a lot of people who live amazingly beautifully in a thousand square feet. And I know you're going from one to the other. And so you're getting rid of things and it feels like, oh, I don't have my stuff anymore, but really truly embracing and living in that thousand square feet, as opposed to shoving a whole bunch of stuff in there so that then you can't do the things that you want to do. That's where the real frustration comes in. So I think about, um, when I moved my mother-in-law into assisted living and those are like teeny tiny little apartments. And we went and looked at somebody else's when we were going through things and she had, she had moved. I mean, I'm sure she got rid of a ton of stuff, but it was shocking how much stuff was in this teeny tiny apartment. Um, like I would say it was at least enough for a 1500 square feet and it was in like 360 square feet or something like that. Um, and it was, it was arranged and it was beautiful. So that was fine. But it was like my mother-in-law, we really tried to go with, what do you need? You need comfortable seating for you and a guest. You need a little small table. So you'll have, you know, but we don't want it to be a big table where people are bumping into it or, it, you know, it's hard to get by with your walker and all that. So it was like, okay, as having less stuff, but just what she needed made her teeny tiny apartment so welcoming because it was just, there wasn't, there was no bumping into, there was no, anyway. So just embracing that and knowing that getting to that point is going to make you really love this space, but you're never going to really love this space if you have so much stuff that you can't actually function in this space. Okay. All right. I'm going to have to stop there because I'm after over 30 minutes and I'm trying to keep these to 30 minutes. You know, I could talk forever. All right. Um, I, okay. Somebody is saying that my book is Still, the new book is still not available in the UK. There have been issues in a lot of different places. I feel like maybe Germany as well. I, I did get an email from somebody recently who it had been delayed for them and they did finally get it. Um, so yeah, I know it's, it. I'm sorry. If I had any control over that whatsoever, you know, I would help you, but I don't. And I think it's just one of those supply chain and shipping issues. So sorry. All right. Um, I will talk to y'all later.